Hey folks, it's Andrew here, and today I'd like to talk about this little module that I built a few years ago. This is a dual ADSR envelope generator. It also has some other modes. And uh, it was part of my summer-long quest one summer to build all the stuff that I wanted in my system but uh, didn't have uh, the willingness to go out and buy and I wanted to just learn a little bit so I did this module and you can actually build this yourself the plans are on my dintree.com website anyway this is called the D101 dual envelope generator and uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit about how it's put together and how it works so basically I like to use microcontrollers uh, which are little one chip computers like this one here this is a pick type microcontroller, the PIC16F690. Uh, I like to use those for doing all kinds of things that uh, would normally take a whole lot of other chips uh, to do the same functions because you can program them with C uh, and write any kind of behavior that you want and they're also really cheap. This one is about a dollar or two dollars, something like that. So. Basically, it's a straightforward envelope generator. It has two channels, attack, uh, decay, sustain, and release pots, two sets of pots. There's a gate input and an envelope output on each channel. There's an LED here that shows the level of the envelope. And then for each uh, channel, there's a switch that selects one of three modes, either ADSR mode, where it runs through all of the stages, attack release mode, which means it'll just go up and then down again to do like percussive envelopes no matter how long the gate is and then there's an LFO mode which makes it cycle up and down and you can I think I think it uses the attack and release controls to set sort of the up and down times you can make LFOs with different slopes on uh, both edges anyway inside's pretty straightforward this is just made with an aluminum panel that's been uh, drilled I've got these pre-cut with with uh, mounting holes in them I got a whole bunch of them made a few years ago and then I just drilled the holes on a drill press using a template that I made on the computer and I center punched the holes uh, with one of those little spring loaded center punches and then I just drilled those on a drill press and to do the, the graphics this is some um, wet transfer paper that you can get at an art store uh, basically you laser print on this and then you put it in warm water and there's like a, a backing that releases and then you can put it on the metal the metal is pre-primed with a gray primer and then I sprayed Varathane over top of it to sort of seal it in and you can see this one's sort of got a little rack rash as they say in this corner it's starting to peel off a little bit but it's not actually that bad this, these are at least four years old or more now um, anyway on the inside are just some regular old uh, 16 millimeter uh, pots that have been wired up um, so basically all the pots go into the microcontroller the microcontroller has a, a dual DAC that generates the two output voltages one for each channel and it actually does both channels of the ADSR in one uh, one chip then there's a power connector here there's a little power supply and uh, there's a programming connector here so that that's how you put the firmware on uh, so here I have the schematic so I can uh, give you a little bit of overview hopefully you can read that alright um, it's really really simple basically the gates coming down here uh, and then there's just a little transistor buffer just using a regular 2N3904 transistor uh, this will respond to any signal above about one volt because I have a little resistor divider here there's a diode that protects this input from going too much negative because uh, the base of a normal transistor you're not supposed to take too negative uh, usually in the data sheet it says about five volts or so uh, so this just clamps it in the negative direction and then notice the diodes after this first resistor so the current won't be very high when when uh, a negative signal is coming in once it reaches about a volt or so on the gate input there will be about half a volt here because this divider is 10k and another 10k in series so it'll see about a half a volt there on the base of that transistor and as it starts to rise right around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 volts that transistor will start to turn on and it will pull this signal low and you can see this signal is normally held at 5 volts 
using this uh, pull-up resistor. But once this transistor turns on, this output will essentially be shorted to ground, and this pin over here will be seeing zero instead of one in the software. Notice that a few of these pins are also shared with uh, the programming connector, uh, so you know you have to sort of make sure that that's not going to cause some sort of problems when you're debugging your code if this is interfering with the inputs. Um, so there's two channels of that. This is the PIC 16F690, which is a really simple little 20-pin chip. There's a bypass capacitor. There's only one power pin. And then there are two switches. These are the switches that set the, the modes for the uh, attack release, uh, attack decay, uh, sorry, attack attack decay, or it's called a attack decay here. It's actually called attack release on the front panel. Now this is this one is I think is wrong. Um, so it chooses one of the three modes, either when one end is shorted or the under other end is shorted, or these uh, switches are the center off type. So if if neither of the the switches are shorted, then it does the center mode. Um, and then over here, there's uh, some signals coming out here. These are SPI signals that are used to control this DAC. This is a 12-bit uh, DAC that makes a voltage between 0 and, I think, 5 volts. Yeah, the reference is connected here to 5 volts. So um, then this will just buffer this signal. This is a, just a 0 to 5 volt output on here. Um, so the, this has a chip select line, this selects the, the DAC, you could add more DACs if you wanted to have other outputs. Um, and then there's a, a serial clock and serial data and those just get clocked out of the software in the microcontroller. And then for the eight pots, those are just wired up across five volts and ground and those are all wired into various analog inputs on here and those, these pots get sampled regularly probably a few hundred times per second. I, I need to check the code to, to be sure. And uh, every time those are sampled, the value gets updated in here, and then that sets the uh, speed or the level or whatever the pot is doing in, in the uh, actual program. Uh, to generate the 5 volts, there's a little low, volt or low current uh, 78L05 voltage regulator here. This whole circuit doesn't take very much power at all especially the 5 volt side. There's no LEDs or anything driven off 5 volts, so this works just fine. Um, if you're building your own Eurorack circuits, I would recommend not using the 5 volt power supply that's available on this power bus here. Um, most people who did that, including myself, have started to move away from that because it, it can have some potential problems if you plug other modules in backwards. You can end up blowing up your module. Um, the 12 volt supplies are, are taken through some diodes here to the plus and minus 12 volts for this op amp. So the outputs here, there's no amplification here, this is just buffering. If you wanted to make a negative 5 to plus 5 range from this, this output of this DAC, you could change this around uh, to add some gain and to also shift the, the point so that zero coming out of here would be some sort of negative voltage. And that's, that's the beauty of using op amps like this, is that you can take any kind of range that might be coming out of your DAC. I use a lot of DACs from microchip that only go from 0 to 2 volts. So often I'm making amplifiers and, and shifters and things using an op amp stage to, um, to move the range and, and, and increase it so that you can set any output range that you want out here. The output's let out through 100 ohms. Normally I use a K ohm nowadays. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using 100 ohms, it just means that you can't passively sum it as easily with other signals. It causes, uh, it can cause a little bit more work for these uh, op amps here. And then the output is also led, each output's led through a resistor, this is just a 1K resistor, uh, that goes to an LED here uh, that will just light up when the voltage is high enough to show you what's going on. Uh, this is a dual op amp, TL082. Uh, the TL084 is sort of my go-to favorite for more modern designs. For prototyping, the TL082 is great. It's just a dual package. Uh, it comes in a little 8-pin package, just like the standard dual uh, op-amp package. These are really super cheap, and they're easy to build on breadboards because you can see the power goes into the corner pins like this so that you can put a, a bypass capacitor right near those pins and each side is basically the same layout but it's swapped um, so or it's flipped over like this 
So if you see how I do this on the back, I, I run a lot of like grounds or power buses around like that. So that's basically it. This is really, really simple. Works really well and you can change the behavior uh, to do anything you want. You could change the time ranges or anything like that just by changing the code. And the code's freely available as well. Anyway, I hope this was interesting and uh, I'll uh, be doing some more module uh, uh, walkthroughs as well. I have a bunch more on my dintree.com site and uh, please build them and uh, try them out and let me know what you think. Thanks a lot. Bye now.